Welcome to uh, the first panel of Ebert Fest uh, 2012. Uh, this is our 14th one of these, and, um, and we hope that we'll be doing at least 14 more. Um, so um, the topic of this particular, I'm Nate Cohn, I'm the director of the festival, in case you don't know that. And all these folks up here are, um, I think, uh, somehow involved in films that are showing at the festival this year. Um, when, when Roger and I select the films that are in the festival, we don't really have any grand scheme in mind or plan. We don't have any themes that we want to address. But after we compile the list of the films, I take a look at them and, and see if there are any common threads that run through them. And this year, it, it, it seemed to me that, that we were showing a, a lot of films that were both personal and political. Um, and there are some, of course, that will say that the personal is always political. And I guess I would be one of those if I could sort of think through the, the theory of it. But I don't do that stuff anymore. Um, so what I'd like to do, if we can, to get started is just go down the, the, the row of panelists here. Um, if you could introduce yourselves and then talk a little bit about the film that you're involved in and, and the personal nature of it, how, how it involves you, how, uh, how you became involved in it. Um, and, um, and if, if you feel like it, expand that into the political. I'm, I'm not asking each of you to make a long speech, just give a little short, short answer toward that end and, and we'll get everybody introduced and then we'll start a conversation about the topic. So Alric, we'll just start with you. Hey guys, um, my name is Alric Brown. I wrote and directed the film Kenya Wanda. Um, I was actually a Peace Corps volunteer and after I left the Peace Corps, I went to film school at NYU and one of my Peace Corps buddies ended up in Rwanda um, doing some uh, field work and he met a genocide survivor who was also an aspiring filmmaker. Several years went by, he and that genocide survivor and I communicated. Um, he's actually here at the festival and he invited me to Rwanda to come and help him make a story, a, a much more personal and intimate story about the Rwandan genocide. So in fact, um, there's two levels of personal connection to the politics. I watched the Rwandan genocide from afar like most of you, but then I met this person who lived through it and he wanted to tell Rwandan stories from a very personal aspect and that's how Kenya Rwanda came to be. Hi, I'm Prashant Pargav, I'm the writer and director of Patang. Uh, the kite. It takes place during a kite festival in Ahmedabad, which is a, a, a city that's been affected by a lot of religious violence in the past, a lot of Hindu-Muslim conflict. Uh, the kite festival is one time, whether you're Hindu or Muslim, young or old, that everybody's on the rooftops together and celebrating. And so my perspective was less so of capturing the political conflict, but turning the camera towards the intimacy of the family. And I think if uh, you just kind of refer to the films that have come out from that region in the past 10 years, they've really focused upon those political issues. So my rebellious uh, statement was more putting the camera on the intimacy and magic of the everyday. Hi, my name's uh, Jacob Isaki. I'm in Terry. I play Terry. Uh, it's a film about sort of an outcast teen who gets befriended by his vice principal and sort of learns how to uh, except who he is and you know it's a very personal experience for me growing up sort of being an overweight teen and uh, putting that honesty inside of the character um, not much politics going on in the film but uh, definitely a very personal experience uh, for me and bringing it to you know fruition bringing it to an honest point of view where people can see how these kids are being affected by what's going on in schools today <coughs> I'm Paul Cox and I'm a filmmaker and I'm here without a film. <laughs> so, but, but you've been here with films in the past. I've been here quite a few times with various <coughs> other films, but in this case, somebody made a film with or without my um, approval. And um, so I'm not a subject of a film. 
I have some reservations about the film, but we can talk about that later. It's not really very relevant. It happened when I was defenseless. But um, it is a little bit embarrassing to come here with a film, without a film. So I'm pleased to be here, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't uh, recommend you going to see that film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of other good films already. Is that a political or a personal statement? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have absolutely no interest in it, and I find it quite embarrassing to see yourself on film, especially when you have always spent a lifetime behind the camera. Suddenly, there's only one little anecdote I must tell you, because it's, it's about when I was told that I had little, little time to live and that I was going to die. And so the first thing that happens, people come and say, oh, let's make a quick movie. You know, we have something to show your children. And um, I said, yeah, OK. Anyway, it's a long story. But when finally I woken up out of having a, a liver transplant and all sort of nonsense, um, facing this sort of new world, and I just managed to get my voice back, because you can't speak for a week or something. And this same filmmaker points, the first thing I saw consciously was a stupid camera lens. <laughs> and he points this lens at me, and he says, how do you feel? <laughs> and that's the worst thing people can say, how do you feel? You know, it's ridiculous, how do you feel? So I remember very clearly that I told him to get fucked. He didn't put it in the film, and <laughs> if he had, I would recommend the movie. <laughs> Your turn. Hi, this is Seema, Seema Biswas from Assam, originally, and from India. And uh, I acted one of the roles in Patang, Prashant, directed by Prashant Bhargav. And uh, this film is, for me, like personal experience, wonderful experience. Uh, being Indian, I didn't know so many things which I got to know <laughs> about India, the beauty of India, the hope and brightness, apart from political controversy. So I thoroughly enjoy this film. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, my name is Robert Siegel. I'm here uh, with the film Big Fan. Uh, it's, uh, it was a very personal film for me. Uh, I personally wrote it. Uh, personally directed it, uh, and <laughs> most personally of all, I personally paid for it, <laughs> which is a surefire way to feel personal about a film. Um, and it, it, uh, it, it's a story of a, uh, an obsessive, uh, hardcore New York Giants fan and kind of a character study about him and uh, those hisses. Uh, He's a, he's a hardcore Giants fan, and um, the character just uh, uh, speaking to the personal aspect of it, it was, was just, uh, I, grew up, I grew up in New York uh, listening to sports radio, and which is what this character does in the movie, and would, would you know, lie in bed at night and listen to these voices uh, from sort of all these far-flung exotic corners of New York, like Flushing and Bay Ridge, and, and I, you know, it just kind of uh, fired my imagination wondering what they were like and what their rooms were like and what their lives were like and you know years later uh, I kind of tapped into all that when I uh, when I wrote the movie. Okay. Uh, Kevin we're just introducing ourselves uh, you're the only one on the panel that's not here with the movie so you're allowed to talk about anything you want to talk about. Okay. <laughs> well um, I wanted to be on this panel because uh, I do work with the Chinese independent film community <coughs> so I felt it was relevant to this um, to this topic. I'm the co-founder of a distribution company in the United States called Degenerate Films, and we specialize in bringing films from Chinese independent filmmakers to the United States. And the films are remarkable because they're made completely outside of the official state system and the, the censorship system. As, as some of you may know, uh, Chinese films are highly regulated, and they need to pass the approval of the government in order to be released within their country. So these filmmakers have worked outside that system uh, telling stories that are, you know, remarkably honest and uh, also um, artistically innovative, very creative and, and just on the cutting edge. And uh, because they're not available to be seen in China, we wanted to give them an opportunity to find a larger audience uh, outside China. And so that's what we do, distributing the films in the United States. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> well, for them, for the filmmakers, yeah. 
for the filmmakers. Uh, I'm Ali Leroy. I'm here with the movie uh, Funny Business of Black Comedy about uh, the rise and fall of a uh, black comedy club in Chicago. Uh, you know, I, I guess it has a lot to do with uh, just the politics of the city and the politics of the business of being in business there. Uh, I'm one of the uh, subjects interviewed in the film, born and raised in Chicago, and I uh, uh, started my career as a stand-up comic. So, um, you know, I was there right in the middle of, uh, you know, the whole experience of seeing that thing, you know, come and become this really hot uh, rising star in the city and then uh, watch it fall away and never be replaced. Uh, my name is Azazel Jacobs. I directed the film Terry, um, which is playing later on tonight. Uh, it's, Terry is based on a story that somebody else wrote, a friend wrote. I, w I had previously made a very personal film and then was looking to tell somebody else's story. So it wound up becoming a personal story, but it wasn't my own story for sure. And I would say that I'm one of those people that subscribe to the idea that doing something personal is political. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you, you know, um, Albert, maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, the, the politics of your film and how it, I, I mean, inevitably it must be compared to Hotel Rwanda. You must hear that a lot. And I don't know if you have. Yeah, I mean, it's, it almost mirrors what this young man just said. You know, we've seen, we've seen versions of the Rwandan genocide from our limited perspective, and that's become law, evil, good, and politics. And it was our belief and our team and Ishmael, the executive producers, believe that you don't end genocides or change that system by just dealing with numbers and politics. You change it and you have an impact by showing people. And in our film, what we did is we took stories of real people, children, a couple going through a divorce, two kids in love, um, to see the genocide from this human perspective. And, um, and within the film, bring out some truths about Rwanda that people didn't even know. The fact that mosques became the safest place in the country during the genocide. And it's just something that never got to us. So there was like a, I was angry that I, of what I did not know about Rwanda. And this film was a, a, a wise response to that anger. I didn't know they spoke their own language. And if you think about the films that came out previously, it informed us, however, Rwandans didn't have a culture. They were just savages. So we wanted to make sure that you could fall in love with these people, you could laugh with them, you could love with them, and that was our intent. And it's a movie about genocide, but it's also, it's completely filled with hope. The genocide interrupts their lives, it not, it's not their lives. And on the question of politics, I teach film as well, and I always say that whether you're, whether you're, you think you're being, being political or not, um, whether you say something you're, or you're not, you are saying something. And so I encourage my students to always, you know, to always, this is an, a privileged medium and it's an expensive medium. And if you're just making this for yourself, this is artistic masturbation. Make work that's gonna have an impact on somebody's life and make this world a better place. I'm not privileged enough to just do this for myself. Um, yeah, that, that, that was nice applause. It, uh, um, <laughs> So Prashant and, and Seema, um, something that he just said sort of resonated with what you just said um, about getting, bringing three-dimensional uh, sympathetic characters to the screen in such a way that they, that they, that, that through their lives, larger issues are addressed. And um, um, I'm just curious, when, when you went into this film, did, how fully scripted was it? How, how much? How much Im did you get from from the place that uh, that you didn't think about when you were first conceiving the film? Well, my uh, my parents are from India, but I grew up on the south side of Chicago, much more familiar with hip hop than India. <laughs> hmm. So, for me to make this film, what was very important to me was to let go of my perspective and understand what the pride of the people were and what their resilience is. So I spent three years doing research, going back and forth, living there, shot 100 hours of research footage. And it was that process of observation and gaining an affinity and connection to that community 
that eventually informed the way that we wrote the script. Finally, when the script was written, I uh, wanted to really focus upon that beauty that I saw in the environment and what was unfolding as the primary foundation for the film in everything, the way that we shot it, 90% non-actors, long takes. So only three out of 40 people read the script. And eventually, 95% of the script was in the final product. But it was very much about people casting them as real people, who they were. For example, there was a boy in the film who's 19 years old. And it was not only his first kiss on camera, it was his first kiss in real life. Mm. So it was that process of allowing people to just be themselves, create that comfort with whatever crew we had, so that whatever's unfolding in this beautiful kite festival with the million kites or uh, in a shop or as two people normally relate, that's what we wanted to keep. And I was very proud that eventually the film that was created for those people in Ahmedabad, it wasn't a story of uh, something that people perceive from the outside. It was a film that they could hold up to the world and say, this is mine. <laughs> and. How was it, uh, how, did, how did the film affect you, or the making of it? Yeah, uh, when initially I read the script, I was very much scared of, uh, you know, like going there in uh, Gujarat, that uh, western part of India, where uh, just few years back, I mean, m mostly two years back, I think, big riot happened that Godra, you know, like um, that with lots of dead bodies, you know, was in, uh, there in the train. So I was a little bit, uh, because it's a small town and uh, where we were going to shoot. So when I went there, the total atmosphere was totally different. You know, most of the uh, street, uh, I mean, slum kids, they were you know, basically Muslim. And most of the uh, other local people, they who were non-actor who participated in our film. So they were uh, Hindu and hardcore uh, Hindu and political uh, people like, you know, like we have some political parties like BJP, RSS, who are hardcore, very seriously believe in Hinduism and all. But uh, on set, we never seen this kind of attitude. And uh, in the kite festival, you, you know, like full of uh, colorful kites flying in the sky, like uh, millions and millions. And who are you know, who is cutting whose flight and who is who's Muslim, who is Hindu, you cannot make out. So it was full of life and music and dancing, everybody. I mean, nobody asking anybody that who are you? I mean, so you can see that we general people, we don't believe in those kind of politics. So those really touched me a lot. So as an actor, other kind of a personal experience was that performing with absolutely non-actors, you know. So, and uh, um, the treatment uh, Prashant had, you know, holding camera for two hours to six hours, and you are on character, whether that particular scene is uh, like uh, one and a half minute scene, mm -hmm. but you are on character, uh, living in the character for six hours. So, absolutely unique experience it was. Okay. Did you kiss anyone in the film? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that was another young generation uh, scene. <laughs> okay. uh, Paul, you spent a lot of time in India. Um, and, but did you ever make a film there? Yeah, I made a, <coughs> a little documentary on, in Calcutta in the old days, I think it was in 65, 66 or something in the time of the Nexalites, it was pretty uh, hectic and uh, had a little, I don't know, for some reason we started this film and uh, we run basically continuously for our lives. They didn't like a white man going into the slums and they thought they had other motivations and all that. But it was a very exciting, wonderful, amazing time and it made me really fall in love with India and I've always gone back. In fact, I hope they go back one more time because at the moment I can't go to third world country. But it's be the first place to go back to because I always thought that my basic growing up happened in India. Mm -hmm. I've been there so many times in so many years and everywhere I went because it was 
something to do with uh, a degree of homesickness and suddenly you get to a country where you feel at home. Mm -hmm. So I almost went back and I started with a little film where, which was really very dangerous. You couldn't lift up a camera because somebody would knife you. And What's the name of this film? A little film called Calcutta. Okay. How original. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about a little city, right? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, Robert, maybe we talk a little bit about uh, Big Fan, and um, I, I know you talked about how personal it, it all was, but uh, um, you really did talk uh, a, a lot about sports culture in, in our society, and, 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 and that's, that's a highly charged subject, and uh, um, did you come away from making this film with uh, a different perspective on that? Well, I think it's best not to, uh, I think, I think uh, for me at least, it's best not to start out trying to make a statement. Otherwise, you wind up with a sort of a preachy movie that's trying to make a statement, and you wind up, mm -hmm. kind of winds up backfiring. It just annoys the audience and probably uh, undermines your point. I, I, I think just make the movie you want to make and then kind of let, uh, for me at least, with this movie, I, I felt like, um, tell this story of a personal, you know, this personal story of one guy and then um, whatever kind of accidentally, whatever comments, uh, you know, statements about race and culture and sports that come out of it, you know, let that happen um, kind of accidentally, subconsciously. Um, and, and, I, and you sort of have to trust that it will come out, you know, it, c it can't not come out in the storytelling, but, but if you um, start out trying to make a point, I think it usually doesn't, uh, usually doesn't work as well. Um, bef before I became a filmmaker, my background was, I was the, uh, the editor-in-chief of The Onion, which is probably, uh, it's probably my, uh, probably better qualifies me for this panel than <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the reason I'm here. Um, you know, and we always, The Onion would uh, uh, often make political statements, but um, mm. our, our rule there was always, it's okay to, it's okay to be funny, and ideally you wanna be funny and make a point, Mm -hmm. um, plan, that's plan A. Plan B is just be funny, <laughs> you know? And the, f the one thing you can never do is make a point and not be funny, <laughs> because then you're in, then it just gets, like I said, um, incredibly preachy and off-putting. Um, so ideally, you, ideally you start with the entertainment and then let the, you know, you start with your dessert and just trust that the vegetables are in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, well, if, th if this panel were uh, an Onion parody of a panel, wh what should my next question be? Oh, God, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I haven't written an Onion headline in like eight years. I'm, I'm a little rusty. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, Ali, maybe you could, uh, we were talking a little at breakfast about uh, working in, in Hollywood and, <coughs> and um, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how hard it is to do something either personal or political in the current environment uh, in, in sort of the mainstream uh, industry? Well, I mean, it's, uh, in the mainstream industry, you know, they, uh, the, the business has no uh, concern about your political or personal leanings. <laughs> you know, I mean, their goal generally is to make as much money as they possibly can uh, even to the extent that when you have an important film, uh, uh, we were discussing his film uh, Bully, that, that's out right now about kids getting bullied uh, in the schools, and, and uh, there was a, uh, um, an argument afoot about the film because it had gotten an R rating uh, because of some of the uh, language in the film. Uh, but the language was used by the kids and it's important for kids to see the film so you kind of defeat the purpose of making a movie and giving it an R rating because the people who it most affects can't go to see it and because when you have an R rating you really can't make any money <laughs> so it's uh, uh, sometimes you wonder you know uh, is the real integrity behind uh, this indignation about the fact that uh, the intended audience really won't necessarily have an opportunity to see the film, which is not entirely true, uh, uh, unfortunately, in this digital age, because you have, you know, a variety of outlets, whether, you know, it's on the web and, and digital downloads and, and pay-per-view, you know, certainly there are opportunities to see a film if you want to get it to an audience, but the opportunity to make a lot of money with a film 
only comes uh, with great box office success. So as much as Harvey Weinstein might be uh, uh, personally, you know, have a personal affront at the idea that this film can't get to the intended audience because he'd like to help them, the other problem is that you're just not going to make any money off right. of it. So the, the personal and political, you know, a lot of times are just, uh, you know, hand in hand. If you make a great personal statement and, you know, it's wonderful if it makes a lot of money. Uh, you know, I think it was, was it Bowling for Columbine was uh, Roger? Uh, um, Michael Moore. Michael Moore. Michael Moore. Uh, Roger Moore. That's James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> it's Roger and me. It's Michael Moore. <laughs> uh, you know, it's really his highest grossing documentary. You know, uh, it was an arresting subject matter, and that allowed him to go and make some other documentaries. But had it not made as much money, he doesn't have enough clout to perhaps continue to do this thing. So uh, Hollywood, you know, uh, What's paramount is can you make us some money? And then if you have something interesting to say or people care about it, you know, well, the, that's good too, you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, speaking about uh, bullies, uh, Azazel, y you were not the bully on the set, right? Of, uh, J uh, Jacob, was I a bully? Not at all, no. I, I well, well, if he was, would you say so? <laughs> um, I would not, no. Jacob. <laughs> Just sit here and smile. <laughs> Maybe we should be asking someone else. Um, <laughs> By the way, uh, I just, I'm dying to say this. Um, do you know, the biggest, most infamous bully in all of Hollywood is Harvey Weinstein. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I've never th th didn't he have a transformation? No, he Not bullied really. the MPAA into giving his film a PG-13. I've read, I've read tons <laughs> about the movie, and I've not once seen anyone make the observation that Harvey Weinstein is a big uh, fucking bully. Uh, <laughs> uh, isn't that ironic? That's uh, yeah. I was gonna say that's that's irony. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's his next film. Yeah. <laughs> I you know I, I, this is not a debate panel, but I just want to clarify um, something Robert said. You know about intentionally making something political versus not. I um I think you know, The Onion had an overall objective, and a filmmaker should go in. I, again, I don't have the privilege of making a film and hoping that some politic will come out in the right place. People have done that for years, and they have portrayed women and black people and b people who are brown in negative ways because they were hoping or letting it become because they could just focus on the personal. I don't have the privilege of being able to do that. The problem with politics and personal is that oftentimes when people set out to make a statement, um, they think that because they're doing a movie about cancer that it's good, or because they're doing a movie about this that it's supposed to support it. No, you still have to have craft, it still has to be entertaining. But having an objective when you walk into a project does not hurt, it's how you then figure out how to get that to the audience. And this is something that I'm passionate about because we, we, we use this phrase all the time, we don't wanna hit audiences over the head. We don't wanna make them uncomfortable. We don't wanna preach to them. And I understand that as an artist, as a writer, as a, and, I, and good storytelling is about smoothing it out, making a room full of a thousand white people laugh last night while you were it, why you are infusing racial politics into the mm -hmm. system of Chicago. Mm -hmm. You gotta give it to people in a subtle way. But I also challenge audiences to think about it. We are not the ones being hit over the head. The Rwandans were. Mm -hmm. We are not the ones being hit over the head. The people who weren't able to perform on those comedy stages were. We have the simple task of sitting back and watching a movie as an audience member and liking it and not liking it. and. There is a certain, and I, 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 I love how you talked about your research. There's a humility when you go into these projects that you should have. And I'm not trying to give credence to films that don't have it if they're not artistically well done. But objective is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, your film is not preachy in any way. I mean, it, and, and that's something that, again, there's a commonality among all your films. Um, and Paul and I were talking about this yesterday, that there's, there's a, uh, I hesitate to use the word reality, but there's a realness to, to, to all the films that, that we're showing in the festival. This, I mean, you, you don't, and maybe Jacob, you could address this, we don't really 
see anybody acting in any of the films. And uh, so the actors on panel, how do you do that? I mean, I guess my goal was to be as honest and truthful as possible. And that just comes with, you know, the work with the director and making sure that you're sort of in, there's a, there's a small kind of line where it's trying too hard and not trying enough. And you have to float in between this little tiny area. And, you know, you want, you just want people to believe that you're this person, even though uh, I have connections with the character, I'm in no way would I say that I'm like him. So it's just, si it's sort of like finding this weird little floating space and there's not a lot of room because you don't wanna, excuse me, you don't want to, uh, you don't wanna make it unbelievable. You don't wanna add all of these things to a person that you think makes them complex because they are a complex person. Usually complexity comes in simplicity. Um, so you want to find the small nuances that are going to make it uh, believable and tangible to somebody watching it. You know, you want to find that little spark that's like, oh, there, I connect with that. That's what I believe in. Like, there's the realness. There's the humanity in that person. And that's sort of what you're always searching for. <coughs> you know? So it's an issue of putting every little tiny experience that you've had into this character without putting Jacob in inside of that, you know, it's, it's just a collection of experiences being brought into life. Okay. Um, Abdel, I mean, uh, obviously your, your film has been probably compared to the documentary Bully. H have you seen it? No, mm -hmm. I haven't. Okay. Yeah, I, I haven't either, because Harvey wouldn't let me see it. <laughs> uh, but I, c I can see it now. Uh, <laughs> But, um, I, I mean, do you consider that a major theme of your, of your film, or does it, uh, is it about something else, really? Yeah, no, no, for me, the bullying was something that, at least in terms of narrative films, I felt like films like Welcome to the Dollhouse and a bunch of other movies had done very clearly and correctly, I, and I didn't really find a space in there. That wasn't m totally my pull into what made Terry interesting to me. I thought that there was this, um, you know, I, I was interested in this, I guess, um, th I mean, there was a few things that pulled me into it, but I was looking for a way to treat uh, these kids the way that I felt I wanted to be treated at that age and to be spoken to in movies in the way that I wanted to be spoken to. You know, I wanted to be spoken to, I didn't want to be spoken down to, and I felt like there was a very clear space to to go there with this story in particular. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny, uh, last night uh, I was joking, we, we, we uh, talked for a little bit after the film, and uh, uh, the audience laughed at a comment that Raymond Lambert made about, uh, you know, eventually going out of business. And, and what I said was that they were laughing at the integrity of his failure. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's odd that this uh, conversation is taking a torn, uh, turn towards bullies because you know, that's kind of what happened to him. You know, he had, he had the best of intentions, he had a, a, a great run of success, and then he ran up against this indomitable force that had no interest in letting him extend his reach beyond something that was kind of a, a pre, you know, a, 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 a pre-designed for, for him to be. It's like, okay, you can have this piece of the pie, but now you want to reach and, and expand and, and, and have your success become something greater than this. We're not interested in having you do that. And, and he literally was put out of business. All of the forces that could be marshaled to stop him from being a success uh, beyond, you know, that thing were, were kind of put into place and he was, he was forced out. And it reminds me of uh, a scene in the film Bully, uh, there's, a, there's a young gay girl, and um, part of her interest in, in living in this town that she's in, once it comes out that she's gay, and, and she thinks that it's a very noble thing to not leave. Mm -hmm. She thinks that if, if I leave, you know, they win. And unfortunately, they win, because there's just so many of them, and they're just, uh, they're so unrelenting that uh, you know, at some point you determine, I guess I have to cut my losses now because these people have absolutely no interest in seeing me be a success. You know, uh, and, and that kind of was, was Raymond's experience. You know, uh, 
you know, he had no understanding, uh, not being from Chicago, he didn't really understand the, the, the political, uh, the segregationist, the racial history of Chicago, of all of the places that he could have come uh, to try and be successful as a black businessman, uh, he probably picked what might be the worst city in the United States to try and do it. Well, I, I think there might, well, as in defense of Chicago, there may be a few others that, <laughs> that might uh, take that title as well. Um, but you're, what you're talking about is political, racial, um, cultural, social bullying. And maybe Kevin, I, I would assume that the films that you're talking about made in China run up against a little of that sort of thing. Sure. I've actually seen a case where an entire film festival was bullied. Um, and uh, the, the example is this, uh, one of the few independent film festivals that exists in China. It's a Beijing independent documentary festival that's been around for about 10 years and it's in the arts and, sort of the arts and culture district in Beijing. Um, it was kind of doing well and progressing and sort of becoming more open, more and more people were knowing about it. But then what happened last year uh, with the events in the Middle East and the Arab Spring, uh, you know, the Chinese government basically said, we don't want this happening here. And there was basically a, a, a widespread sort of lockdown on uh, any sort of activity that could be perceived as subversive, uh, including the production and exhibition of independent documentary films or, or any films made outside of the state system. So this film festival, uh, they, they saw this coming and so they figured out, okay, well, let's figure out what we can do. Um, one of the organizers said, well, maybe we can go back to my hometown, you know, my, my, my friends work in the government there and maybe we can do that. So they went to a neighboring province to organize a festival, but as soon as they arrived, uh, I guess word got out, and so they were met by police who said, nope, can't have it here. So they had to move the festival back. They had all their guests, you know, like, what can we do? Well, here's our plan. We'll uh, go back to our original location, hold the festival there, but uh, what we'll do is we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll, ha we'll hold a cookout at the same time. So we'll have things being grilled outside of the movie theater, and we'll have a couple of lookouts at the gate of our, of our festival compound. And so when the police come, and the thing is like, you can't even tell that they're police, they're just sort of like plain clothes people who are you know, instructed to make sure there are no activities going on. As soon as we see those people and we know who they are, um, we will sort of do a, uh, a, a silent alarm call in and then everyone who's in the movie theater will have to go out and start pretending that they're barbecuing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is, you know, this is sort of what happens when you're in a culture that doesn't, you know, promote um, events like this, frankly. So, um, you know, so something really to, n that we shouldn't take for granted, just the, the, the opportunity that we have to talk about these things, about, you know, all the political forces that shape how movies are made, how movies are distributed, how movies are seen and received. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I I'm just grateful that such work is, you know, somehow they find a way uh, to, uh, to continue making this work. And, uh, and I think probably because there are so many avenues to find out, you know, even though they've tried so hard to filter the internet and censor it, um, you know, s information still gets out there and people find out about these films. And so a scene, you know, a movement is still able to continue. And, uh, and I think it'll just continue to grow that way. Yeah, we, uh, we, we just gave a Peabody Award to uh, the past couple of years to, to a number of Chinese uh, documentaries, particularly about the, the earthquake and, and, and it also about the migrations to the cities. And, and these are made by, by Chinese television and, and they're pretty powerful and pretty critical. Um, and so I, I don't know if that's a sign that things might be opening up a little bit for, uh, for filmmakers. Um, yeah, I think that's... I think that's just sort of a function of China's emerging role in the world because it's become so prominent and so integrated with, uh, with the global economy and with, you know, with the culture. I mean, look at this school, look at how many you know, foreign students from China are here. Um, you know, and that, and I, I see that as a tremendously positive thing because they're exposed mm -hmm. to you know, values and ideas beyond what they would be exposed to at home. And that's, that's gonna filter back. Yeah, uh, I think I was told yesterday University of Illinois has the largest Asian student population of any university in the country. 
and that some of the best restaurants in town, in case you want to know, are just down on Green Street. They're just small uh, Asian, you know, Indian, um, Thai, Chinese uh, restaurants. So, and they're very inexpensive. And they're a lot better than the uh, Chick-fil-A in the basement of this building. <laughs> Um, Paul, is there anything you want to talk about? Well, we're talking about politics and film, and um, I think everything you do with your heart and soul is somehow a political statement. You know? I think in most... <coughs> film is one of the greatest gifts to this century, to all of us. It's not really that old. It is a, a language we can all share. And that's, I also feel it's the most abused and misused medium on earth. Because most films are such absolute shit, you just don't want to, you know, I'd rather read a book than see most films. And that is the truth for the matter. And there are so many brilliant young people doing so many brilliant, wonderful things. Fortunately, now they can make a film with a little camera and they can go out. But nobody will see it, you know, they just show it to your friends. and. Now and then something leaks through the, the, the cracks and comes to life, but it happens very rarely. And I find it always very um, encouraging and hopeful when something like uh, the separation happens. Mm. A film made and based on the reality of now where people are just people. I can't stand people acting anymore. I think it is ridiculous to see, for instance, a film like the Iron Lady, where a wonderful actress pretends to be somebody else who all know and who's hopelessly uninteresting, <laughs> and then <laughs> plays a senile person for the rest of the film without showing us anything, how and what. There was nothing political about that film, and it should be a political film. And that's a weak piece of shit, and so, <laughs> and <laughs> let me not start, you know. No, I, I will not, not go into it. It's too early in the morning, but <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely it's such a pity because I think all of us, we need to uh, see a bit of reality on the big or small screen. As, as T.S. Eliot said, mankind cannot stand too much reality. That's why the world is, is so hopelessly out of tune with itself, with nature, with the universe, with everything. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody that is thinks and feels and struggles would automatically be, make, I make films about people, nothing else, but I regard them as extremely political films. The very act that they get the money together to make films about two old people fucking. That's what I was called once, how dare I make a love story about two people that get together, they go to bed. It's a very poignant little film called, I um, can't even remember the name, Innocence. And the opposition that happened to make a film about reality because we all long, we all hurt, and we all scream, and we all love. No, 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 there's no room for this because we've got to make money. And the, the most ridiculous thing that's happened is that film actually fell into the hands of a a greedy, single-minded power of Hollywood, because they also own most of the cinemas around the world, and everybody, everywhere around the world, where somebody makes an, a truly indigenous film, they won't even get into their own cinema, and if they do, they'll have to move within a week or two, because Hollywood will bring out its next bo a blockbuster. And I think that sort of state has been going on for uh, all the years, since the Second World War. Um, and uh, I think that's the basic battle. It's very important to make films that, that make people think and feel and remember and be a member of, the, be, be proud of belonging to the human race. Most of the time I'm disgusted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> See, Paul, what we have here are a group of young filmmakers <laughs> who have their lives ahead of them. <laughs> so have I. Uh, you know he. he <laughs> <laughs> you know he's right, but he, he you know people shouldn't be uh, people should not enter into show business under the assumption that any well especially not 
uh, uh, show business as it is done in uh, in the states. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a it's a it's a capitalistic industry. Like I said, their 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 main interest is making as much money as they can on whatever product they put out. If some of that happens to be uh, thought provoking or interesting or promote some sort of change in the world, well, you know, that's good too. But their main interest is in making as much money uh, as they can. And what uh, Ulrich said, which is interesting, is that as a society, we kind of have this privilege to indulge in this one great endless fantasy. Uh, and uh, people from around the world don't have that same luxury to use uh, film and to use all of these great technological advances to, you know, to put out a cool dance song and, and have that be the end of it. You know, so uh, uh, America as a culture has become incredibly, incredibly, incredibly uh, self-indulgent. Uh, and and kind of juvenile, you know. There's a huge arrested development going on. Uh, uh, you know, we're incredibly narcissistic, uh, so we have tools and money, and we use all that to aggrandize ourselves in uh, the most immediate ways we possibly can. You know, so it, the whole place has turned into a big Kim Kardashian society. Mm -hmm. Exactly, know. and and using film as a you know exporting film like chicken wings and hamburgers. It, no, precisely yeah. like chicken wings and hamburgers. How do we do it volume? And you know, that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, I, Iron Man or the Avengers is going to open day and date in, in markets all across the way. And, and, you know, there's absolutely no reason for people in India to be rushing out to see the Avengers when they're literally poor people using the toilet in the streets. Like, you know, why, why is this film important? You know, it, it's not that you shouldn't have access to, you know, to entertainment. It's not that you shouldn't be able to do these things, but the, the level of import is so incredibly skewed uh, that, you know, movies that should be being seen by everyone run against all sorts of roadblocks. The fact that we are even supposed to be literate people and should have an uh, interest in what the hell is going on around the rest of the world. You know, the difference between the, the BBC America News and CNN it's it's like oh wow there, there are things happening on Earth and we just are kind of uh, removed from that. It's like ah, don't 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 worry about that. What about hey, look, look, you know, it's a movie about a dog. It's great. <laughs> I mean, I find it a little. Uh, our film premiered at Berlin last year, and I guess I'm one of these one young filmmakers on the panel, and it's been tremendously difficult for me and a very uh, bipolar experience trying to figure out. Where do you go next? Because India is a place that's known for Bollywood or Slumdog. There's not a sophistication mm. with audiences to truly understand that cinema can come from the place that's like Korea or Mexico or Iran, where you can allow a, an audience to be active and involved and make their decisions. Slumdog to me was that greasy tandoori chicken. You know, I like to say that our film is more of my mom's home cooked samosas. But it's really hard now to kind of say, where do you go next? Because uh, I tried to make a film that was very personal and innovative in its form and all of that, but then where's the venue to uh, share that film? And, you know, we're figuring it out and we're championing the product and we'll be releasing the film and all, but on the next one, you, you tend to kind of think, which, where do I make concessions? Who am I really? And I think that looking at this panel and Nate saying that everyone, what's a common thread is that we've reached within and are telling real stories is something that I will not let go of. But the form in which you kind of tell the story, you have to understand and pay attention to the audiences. You mentioned poor people in India and the Avengers. They would love the Avengers because it's an escapist film. Why do they want to see themselves poor on screen all the time? They want to leave that. So you, you know, here we are as kind of righteous, progressive people wanting to tell these stories, but many times those people that we want to tell stories about actually want to see the most Hollywood things because that's what makes them happy. And is, are we making films for them or for ourselves? So I mean, even that statement that you made is kind of interesting because it's a very gray area.
Well, the question for me is not, uh, uh, you know, certainly people who are uh, having a hard time, you know, want to be entertained, but what is uh, kind of paramount is for the people who are using that as a, as a form of distraction. It's like, it's, uh, uh, you know, America's interest with black people in the past, you know. Uh, so if you want to make a movie and you want to put some black people in it and it happened anywhere between ooh, 1920 and 1960, you might just have a shot of getting that film made, you know. Uh, it's kind of a, a, you know, it's kind of this comfortable distance uh, from what is actually happening to a, a growing population of disenfranchised people. So if you can kind of romanticize a, a feeling about yourself that you'd like to think the way that those people thought in a time that you kind of had absolutely nothing to do with, you know, let's make a movie about that, then we can feel good about ourselves. You know, so, uh, you know, certainly people who are disenfranchised and poor and living in abject poverty right now would love to not be in that and would love to get some distance from it but for the people who are actually presenting things to them uh, to distract them as opposed to remove them from their condition, I think we have a greater responsibility uh, as a society to put more effort and more energy into removing them from the condition than from distracting them from the condition. Yeah. You know, I think Aldrich and I kind of encounter the same thing where when you look at European audiences or American audiences, how they receive our films, many times probably the critique of both our films is it's not tragic enough, it's not dark enough, you're not showing enough kind of conflict in these films for them to actually, you know, you're not objectifying your people enough so we can actually enjoy the film. And that's a big struggle for us, you know, to, to when we're, same thing. You know, I, I, there's, it's, it's gray, but it's not that gray. What Paul is, I think, I'm, I'm gonna defend Hollywood for a second because I think we're all on the same page because it, every Hollywood film that I love is extremely political and poignant. And if you go into the regular theater, I'm not talking about your independent theaters, walk into a regular theater and watch how Americans walk out really like, eh, I just ate a burger or bad french fries. They're walking out with a lackluster feeling. And then every once in a while something Will, will be made where they walk out, well that actually had a real something, some essence there. Like I'll use Shrek in exa as an example. Shrek is this unapolitical film, right? Cartoon for kids, it's fun to watch. Mm -hmm. It could be escapism, but what is it really about? I mean, this is a movie about changing the whole perspective of what beauty actually is in the world. The green ogre that farts, and who's normally the bad guy, is now the good guy, and the blonde-haired, blue-eyed prince is the bad person, it, and 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 that's what and 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 so I, I go back to what I said. Everything is political, whether you choose to say something or not, and how you choose to say it. The issue really becomes if they gave him the same amount of money to promote Shrek, would the paradigm change a little bit? Just a little bit of that money to, to, to in open up in those same markets. Uh, you know, and that, that's, that doesn't happen. They don't put the same amount of advertising, the same amount of outlets don't exist. You, we say that audiences want to go and see these particular films. Well, that's because that's what we've been feeding them. If you lowered the price or made, you know, name a famous and inexpensive restaurant, and now the, those people could access that easier. You know, when people in my neighborhood are talking about my film, people in my, you know, black community are talking about independent film because of this film that I made. So now they might look at the other independent film next to mine and the other independent. That's just because they had access to this story. And I'm not saying that, I'm not sure exactly what I'm saying, <laughs> but <laughs> there is something to how people are fed this stuff and things have the potential of changing if we do put more value on these type of stories. I, I think that people have been brainwashed and fed the wrong stuff for a long time. And the people on this panel actually have something that the world needs and wants to eat. It's, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's really uh, refreshing, I think, to to hear these these young filmmakers and one old filmmaker <laughs> <laughs> um, 
their the, the, their attitude towards cinema. That they're they're smart, they're knowledgeable, and they're making films that uh, um, that we really really need to see. And it's it, you know, it it gives it renews my faith in in the industry. Um, I remember when Paul first came to the festival. Um, you remember uh, you came with the attitude that film was dead. And um, and then you said the festival sort of brought film for you brought film back from the dead, mm. um, and um, I, I think what we're trying to do is bring filmmakers like this to the festival to give them uh, a place to be heard for their work to be seen. Um, so if if you all have any questions, um, uh, there's a microphone. And uh, we, we have about 15 minutes to have questions. And I was going to speak in defense of hamburgers and chicken wings, but I, I, won't, <laughs> I won't do that. Hamburgers and chicken wings are doing just fine. They don't need your help. <laughs> <laughs> I wish they wouldn't be so appealing. You know, that's the problem. Go ahead. Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, this question is for Ulrich and uh, Prashant. Um, Something you touched on very early on in the panel, I hope you can expand on a little bit. Um, both of your films are <coughs> uh, very political, also tell very personal stories, but you're both sort of outsiders from those places and people. So what, um, uh, what advantages and disadvantages do you think there are to bring that outsider's perspective? And then, um, Azazel, you might be able to speak on that too, since you had said you're, you were with Terry, you were trying to make someone else's sort of story, and it kind of became your story, but, but you were sort of an outsider in, in that as well. Thanks. You know, interestingly, the, he, he gave the answer. From an from a outsider perspective, the most important thing for me to do in Rwanda was to humble myself to not walk in there with judgment, to walk in there with a research mentality. Because if you say Rwanda, automatically there, there are psychological things that happen that prime you and how you're gonna interact with those people. And if you've seen those other films, there are already things that are set into place. So to erase those things and to approach each person as an individual. And I was able to do that because I was an outsider a little bit as well. But, you know, but, and, and I, and, and here's the thing, I'm an outsider there, but I'm, what am I in America? Being, a, ha having my black skin and going to a college and being one black person in a classroom or whatever, or, be, or having d experienced racial discrimination here gave me some insight to the prejudices or just being a dark-skinned African-American as opposed to a light skin when I'm amongst black people when I was a kid, I was called you know, blackie or whatever. You know, so I had all these little experiences that let me understand. And the thing is to understand, not to accept or to like or to look at the conflict between the Hutu and Tutsi and take sides, just to understand where this came from. Um, the, and I, I, I lived in Africa for a while, so there were certain things that I didn't have to cultural things that I could, I could squeeze through the bullshit faster than most outsiders. Um, and I also spoke French, so I speak French. So having that language, um, I guess the biggest downfall, well, I mean, I'm trying to think of a downfall, but you know, I, I, it's not my story. I took every downfall and made it, took, made it an advantage. I think that's the real way to look at it. It wasn't my story to tell. I wasn't there during the genocide. So I also had to humble myself to Ishmael and to the people who lived through it. So even when I was writing the script, I didn't write one line without going to a Rwandan and saying, what do you think of this moment? What do you think of this thing? And sometimes they were like, no, <laughs> don't do it. And my arrogance as an American director, I'm like, come on, I'm an artist. Of course I'm gonna do that. And he's no, <laughs> we don't do that in Rwanda. And you know what? Most artists would have not listened. And I did. I said, I'm gonna use this limitation that he just gave me and find another way to create this moment. So I turned all of the outside things into positives. 
I think Aldrich touched on something very important when you're an outsider. A lot has to do with your personal background and having a great deal of diversity and as he mentioned, being an outsider growing up. You know, that kind of sensitivity and openness is what allows you to get into another community. You really have to be, offer everything that you have. I would like to actually ask Seema to answer a little bit of this question. I don't know if you know Seema Biswa. She was uh, the actor in Bandit Queen. She's one of India's finest actors. And uh, when she first encountered this script, she was like, oh no, there goes another Indian American making a film. Mm -hmm. And then, if you could comment on what happened next, <laughs> following that, when you experienced the shoot. You know, seeing me come from the outside. Yeah, the casting director came with the script and narrated the story also, I read the script. I was not sure because so many things I didn't understand and uh, kind of role I was looking for, I thought yeah, that is not challenging for me. So I thought uh, um, for this character, the Sudha name of the character, um, I was not, I was like not uh, so excited. Then Prashant Sen mailed me whole story about uh, Sudha, this character and detail and all. After that also, <coughs> I thought I read this uh, character in detail even then I could not visualize myself how to, you know, like do it. Then I thought I'm not sure because for me, like uh, NRI, you know, non-residential Indian people, whenever they, you know, uh, shot India, like in different, they're in their point of view. So uh, for example, in India passing a dog, you know, like street dog, it's not a big issue. It's like matter of fact, but when NRI, you know, Prashant kind of director, they, I mean, not, I'm exactly not pointing out Prashant, but they, you know, like focusing on that, passing the dog, you know, street dog, it's a very important thing for us. Like, so that's why I wanted to go there in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad, a small town, and Raipur, where they were you know, practicing and doing workshop with street children and, uh, you know, like non-actors and all local people. So when I went there, uh, totally I was very much, you know, like mesmerized. I was really, uh, it was very pleasant surprise for me that Prashant was like uh, one of the friends with those children, you know, like uh, slum kids and um, talking with them like a friend and, you know, like they had exhibition of you know, all painting done by those children and uh, photography and uh, you know, like they were performing something, singing and dancing. For me, like I could not do myself being Indian and you know, like I was not so much friendly with them. So I was really impressed. And uh, I felt like uh, the next step was um, Prashant mom, Ranjana ji, she took me, you know, like she had whole, I went there for a few hours, uh, just for seven, four hours. It's, uh, I, I stay in Bombay and they were shooting in Gujarat. It's like one night journey by train and uh, so, and uh, Ranjana, you know, he, she had whole agenda that way to take, she, you know, like took me there in the um, market, uh, you know, like some, just to observe those market people and local people. Then uh, uh, particularly the, this character, my uh, character Sudha, the example was there, one lady called um, Rohit's mother who is, uh, I, what is the background? I don't know. Uh, so, Seema went on an experience where she met a lot of the local people and one of my very good friends was a lower middle class guy. And what I was very touched with was that she went there and she sat with her and started to cook with her and it was through that process of exchange with local community members that Seema really started to immerse herself into that experience. And so that kind of process of the outsider, you know, there is that dog thing, but if I could take it a little bit deeper, there is a very distinct difference between what the Indian independent movement sees in, uh, and what they make films about and what I make films about. But for Seema as an actor and also in that research preparation, it was just saying this environment as it is, what's unfolding in front of us, it's beautiful. I love Ahmedabad, I love the people there. And for me to kind of create a space so that Seema can immerse herself 
and, all, and become that person that people have to live on screen. That's magical. I think that's something that only an outsider can do. Because when I walk around New York or Chicago and I hang my head and I'm walking around, I don't really see everything. But when I walk into a place, I can see something completely different. And that was something that I wanted to share with you as an actor to give you that space to get there. Uh, yeah, I think we could talk on this topic uh, all day, but um, you know, who has the right to tell what story? But uh, I think, uh, do we have another question? Can I just jump in there for a second? I just, uh, I mean, this is kind of connected, but um, and maybe this is a defense of the industry. I just, I moved to Los Angeles about 13 years ago with a very strong idea that I wanted to make independent films. I wanted to make my personal movies the way that I could, and. Um, and that I was determined, and that the industry was something completely separate. But what I quickly found out was that I very much needed the industry to make these films, and I needed film, I needed cameras, I needed help, I needed props, I needed sets, and I'd wind up um, you know, calling these places and, and telling them, look, this is what I'm doing, I'm doing something that I believe in, and this is something, I have no money, I don't have any other way to pay you other than to say, like, this is something that I care about. And I constantly found very, I found human beings on the other side. And this idea that this was the enemy uh, very quickly dissolved, that I, there were humans in Kodak, there were humans at these camera shops, and that they may have this industry going on, they have to, they may be making a ton of money somewhere else, but there was actually somebody to connect to that allowed me. And I've really been able to make movies because of this kind of trickle down of, this industry. I mean, that's really the only way it's happened for me. And in terms of how I put to get Terry together, I mean, this is my fourth film in. So what happens is you kind of, you start, you're an outsider, but you wind up seeing that there's a whole world out there. There's, there's actually people in the heart of Hollywood that have an idea that can moved out there for maybe very similar reasons, and that becomes your group. So you're not feeling like an outsider anymore. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe two more questions. First of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I have uh, just a couple questions. One's really short. Kevin, um, I just uh, would really be interested in hearing some of the films that um, are coming out of this Chinese independent film company. And a second for Jacob and uh, Zazel. Um, I, uh, I, when I was in middle school, I was a victim of bullying. And I just want to hear if you've had any sort of conversations with people within the school system or maybe with students who have uh, had that experience and really benefited from your film. Okay, so actually to follow, as it looks, I've, I love Terry, so I, I have a lot of respect for your films and what you, the path you've taken to make them. Um, speaking for myself, I'm you know, fairly kind of disgruntled with the whole the way that the independent film scene is kind of structured in the United States. You know, I've been to Sundance once and just came away very, just kind of disillusioned by what I perceive as people more interested in business than about the art of film. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I, because of that, I've been looking, I was looking for another alternative method of making independent films and I, I kind of found it in China because when you look at the filmmakers and what they, what they do there, I mean, it's, it's really like raises this question that every filmmaker should ask themselves in, in, at one point. It's like if you had no, uh, no way of having your film seen in your own country, would you make your film? So, I mean, you know, that, that's, that's a very stark situation, but it's, it's the reality over there. And it hasn't stopped, you know, hundreds of these uh, DIY do-it-yourself filmmakers from picking up a camera and just telling a story that they feel completely passionate about usually related to a social issue that they want to depict that is not being shown on TV, that is not being discussed in the media, but they see it and they feel it needs to be captured because if they don't capture it, it's as if it never existed. So to answer your question about what kind of films are made, within the documentary realm, uh, you know, films about uh, you know, the, the problems of migrant labor uh, in China, <laughs> homelessness, uh, drug addiction, corruption, I mean, there's this one remarkable film. It's amazing what you can get away with in China if you just have the right connections. Uh, you can film pretty much anything. So it's not about, you know, it's not that filmmaking itself is, the, the subject matter is censored. It's just you can't distribute them. So, for example, this one, 
this one guy, um, you know, he's, been, he's made films about drug addicts and, and you know, con all kinds of interesting topics, um, and he's won awards internationally, and so he was at this kind of VIP banquet, and this government official was sitting next to him, he's like, oh, you're a filmmaker, you should make a film about me. He's like, because, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, because I'm, I'm about to end my tenure as a, uh, as a county, uh, you know, Communist Party official, and I kind of want to commemorate, you know, my, my tenure. So, you know, you're a award-winning filmmaker, make a movie about me. It's like, are you sure that's a good idea? <laughs> yeah, it's, you, if you can't make a movie about me, you can't make a film about any government official. So he, he spent <laughs> six months with this guy and got amazing footage of all kinds of, like, backroom dealings, and, uh, you know, it's like, oh, so, you know, well, what do we receive today? Oh, we got, you know, we got a, a package of money from this, this party who wants their construction site bill, we got this bribe from here. Okay, well, you can accept this one, but we should re refuse that one. It's just like amazing, amazing like material. And, uh, you know, so it's like people just don't, they don't even think about what's, you know, what's possible. Anything is possible. Um, so that that's sort of it kind of opens your eyes to the, the freedom. Um, and I guess because, you know, there are no rules. I mean, people are, People don't think about, you know, an industry or whatever. They just see a story and they pursue it. Um, but then, yeah, the, the challenge becomes, okay, now these movies are made, how do we get them seen, so. But that's a great question. I mean, would you make these things if no one's gonna see it? Uh, my, my father's been making abstract films since the 50s, and I mean, talk about outside. I mean, there's, he's would never be even on a panel like this. We're talking about the way, way, way outside. And he's been making his um, films first and foremost for himself and then for my mom. And if the world is interested then in them, he's excited. But I mean, he's, he's really making this work and it's constantly making work that sometimes, it's gonna come out to the same few people if it goes out at all. Um, and it, it was a question that was raised you know, I think it's been really important for me to feel like that being selfish about work is, is an important thing. I think that the, to answer yourself is probably the most difficult and challenging, for me at least. Um, in terms of this, whether this film has reached other people that have been bullied, I definitely felt like it's, you know, um, I've had very nice messages and emails and people coming up to me, and I believe Jacob has as well. It definitely is a testament when someone comes up and says that they see their story. And especially I like that, you know, like I'll hear about schools showing, I mean, the, the, I had the same issue that my film was rated R, so, but I know that kids are gonna get to, I got to R-rated films, and I just hope that they do as well. And, but I like it when I hear from teachers that that's been the best, actually. I feel like, wow, a teacher sees it and they see either themselves or it's kind of realigned something that they want to see in themselves. That's a good thing. Yeah, I was most surprised by the variation of age range of people that were telling me that they were bullied. Because um, I think the bullying epidemic is something that's been very prevalent in the, these last few years. But I think it's more of a universal thing. I think everyone's been bullied. I mean, I even remember watching Leave It to Beaver, and he had a bully. You know what I mean? It's it's a very universal sort of thing. And I was very surprised when older people, people older than me, were coming up. You know, uh, grandparents or uh, uh, teachers being like, "This is a story that I relate to when I was a kid," or even when they weren't kids, when they're in the workplace. You know, something so similar. And that was very interesting to me, and it it, it kind of opened my perspective of how many people are uh, affected by this one thing, and it's almost like everybody's affected by this one thing, so you know, we're all in it together, but it's still an issue that we can't stop, even though like every person here has probably been made fun of, and additionally made fun of someone for something. You know, it's, it's so bizarre that everybody's been a part of it in a way, but it can't be stopped, or it, it, you know, it's, it's almost futile. It's almost like the way of man. Yeah, there's nothing we can do. Okay. Uh, exactly, you know. Um, <coughs> we're running a little over, so uh, you'll be our last question. Okay. Uh, I, it's just a sort of a comment, but a question. Uh, I'm impressed also with the diversity of viewpoints and representation in general, but I do note that the panel is nine to one, male over female. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I wonder, is that just reflective of where the, the artistry is? 
because I'm pretty sure they aren't nine to one women over men in the upper levels of the insiders. So um, it, is this just the way things are? And if so, will they ever change? <laughs> My second question is for you, Nate Cohn, and it is, I think you said early that uh, there, there are no films in the festival where people are acting. Did I understand you? Oh yeah, I said something like that. Yeah. Uh, did you see Meg Ryan last night? Yeah, she was acting. <laughs> <laughs> but she's a good actor. <laughs> um, and even Tom Hanks was a good actor, uh, which doesn't happen very much lately. Um, okay. So uh, anyhow, let's, uh, I, I want to thank the panel. I, I think it was an extraordinary discussion, and uh, I think we learned a lot. So thank you all very much. And the, the next panel with Roger's far-flung correspondence will start in seven minutes. Did you